Amos chapter 9, 8 through 11. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, that being the northern kingdom of Israel, or Ephraim, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. So now we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 16, the breach. We know that the northern kingdom was kicked out of the land, and you can find that in 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, around 11, 13th verse. Verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles of the flesh, who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So in reference to Gentiles in the flesh, Paul is stating that the Gentiles are of the northern kingdom or the ten tribes. Verse 12, that at that time ye were without Hamishiach, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without the most high in the world. In the context of the scriptures, Christ was the propitiation for the sins of the northern and southern kingdom. So basically, he was the one who initiated the two kingdoms to receive the promises. So now we're at Romans 9, 3 through 4. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Amishiach for my brethren and my kinsmen according to the flesh. Verse 4, who are Israelites, to who pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of the Most High and the promises. So in reference to kinsmen, Paul is stating that the northern kingdom, which are described in the New Testament as the Gentiles, which are Israelites or the ten tribes. As we can see, kinsmen now made of the same race, which means sea lion or family, one related by blood, relative by blood. Now we're back at the word Gentile. The Latin adjective also meant of or belonging to the same nation. Hence, as a now Gentiles might mean men of family, persons belonging to the same family, fellow countrymen, kinsmen, but also foreigners. And then we have barbarians. So Paul is stating that uh, his fellow kinsmen in the flesh were the northern or the ten tribes that did not receive the, the covenants or the promises. So now we're at Commonwealth, mid 15th century a community, a whole body of people in a state, any body of persons united by the same common interest. Now, unification of King David, there was no northern or southern. They were unified. But through the worship of Baal or Baal, they were kicked out of the land. So the Most High divorced his people. Reading on, verse 13, But now in Hamishiach, Yahawashai, or Yeshua, Ye who sometimes were far off made nigh by the blood of Christ. For ye is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In reference to the wall, the wall was fractured during King David, his son Solomon, and Jeroboam. So as I stated earlier in the video, Christ or Hamishiach was a propitiation for the sins, not of the world, but for the northern and southern kingdom okay so christ in all actuality was a nationalistic figure he was not the global savior figure which is osiris or tamus on the left hand side that the world or the catholic church and different religious systems believe in so overall in essence they have assigned hamishiach as a global savior figure when in actuality he was a nationalistic figure and we have to remember when reading the scriptures, there was so much hate and enmity between the two kingdoms of the North and the South. Civil war in the essence. But Hamishiach or his death was supposed to eradicate that. So now we're at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 17. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers, there's that word again, and foreigners, okay, but fellow citizens with the saints, who are the saints, the Israelites, or the Hebrews, and of the household of the Most High. So now we're at Psalms 148, verse 14. He also exalted the horn of his people, and the horn is the rulership, 
the praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him. So now we're at Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 3 through 5. Yea, he loved the people, all his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeserun when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. So now we're going back to Amos chapter 9, verse 9. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Like a corn is sifted in a sleeve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up the ruins and I will build it as the days of old. So now we're in Romans chapter 11, 14 through 17. In Paul's understanding that the falling away from the southern kingdom or branches, the northern kingdom, which is Ephraim, can be grafted in, the southern kingdom returning as well. Verse 14, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? but life from the dead. Verse 16, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partaketh of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Now we know that the olive tree is talking about the Northern Kingdom, which are the Gentiles or Israelite foreigners. So now we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 11, 14 through 17 to get the symbolism of the olive tree. Verse 14, therefore, pray not thou for his people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. What has my beloved to do in my house, seeing she has wrought lewdness with many and the holy flesh is passed from thee? When thou dost this evil, then thou rejoicest. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of a goodly fruit. And the goodly fruit is in reference to the northern kingdom. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee has pronounced evil against thee. For the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So let me read that again. For the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger and in offering incense unto Baal. So the Most High does not like it when our people worship Baal or Baal. For instance, the Catholic Church, they venerate Baal or worship Baal or Osiris. The baby is Horus or Hippocrates and the Virgin Mary is Aset. OK, so the Christian church is sprang from the Catholic church. So now we're at Romans chapter 11, 18 through 20. Paul is speaking to the northern kingdom or the kingdom of Ephraim or Israel. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. So as we can see, Paul was speaking to the northern kingdom who was grafted in. And saying to them, don't boast against the southern kingdom, which is the kingdom of Judah, who don't get it, that salvation that came through the Hamishiach or Christ. The southern kingdom fell off because of pride and root equals um, descendant. So basically, you know, when a tree has its roots, its its foundations is the, the ground, the dirt and out, you know, spring from the roots, the branches. So like Paul was saying to the northern kingdom, don't boast against the branches, which is what happened to the southern kingdom.
pridefulness is what got them kicked out of the land and so forth. So now we're in Acts chapter 13, 45 through 48. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spoke against those which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Verse 46, which is in reference to uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 18. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should come first, have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles, which is in reference to the northern kingdom. So Judah was very prideful. In other words, they were very high minded and didn't receive it. So they went to the Gentiles. Now we're in the book of Acts chapter 10. Now we know Cornelius was a devoted man. And during his time, there was no New Testament. There was no Christianity. Now there was only the Tanakh or Torah. There was no New Testament, quote unquote. Verse 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get down thee, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is it the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth the Most High, and of a good report among all the nation of Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee unto his house and to hear the words of thee. So we know that Cornelius was of the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, or the Gentiles. So now we're going to skip down to verse 24. And the marrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen, there's that word again, and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met with him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. So what would man worship be today? In the form of fans or fanatics, whether it's sports, movies, entertainment, etc. So... In essence, you're not supposed to worship a man. You can admire his abilities and his trade sets and skills and or hers per se. But the worship of another man or woman, no, it's just a fanatic. Verse 26. But Peter took him up, saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many were come together. And he said unto them, ye know how that it is. A unlawful thing for a man that is a quote unquote Jew or Judean to keep company or come unto one of a, another nation, that being the ten tribes or the northern kingdom. But the Most High has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So the Most High sent Peter that dream in reference to the uh, grafting in of the northern kingdom. Because as we can see, there was an infraction between the two. Most of the quote unquote Jews or Judeans thought of the northern kingdom or Gentiles as unclean or beast. So in reference to Peter's dream or vision, a lot of these churches, Christian sets and whatnot, this is their justification for eating pork or swine. And we know that's not biblical and that's not scripture. Reading on verse 29, therefore, Come I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Verse 31 And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy alms are had in remembrance in the sight of the Most High. So we know that the Most High is dealing with his people because he said that Israel was a people near to him. Now we can find this in Psalms 147, verse 19 and 20. So now we're back at Acts chapter 13, verse 47. 
For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have sent thee to be a light of the Gentiles, meaning the northern kingdom, or Ephraim, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles, or northern kingdom, heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many were ordained to eternal life, believed. So in reference to that scripture, those people were born to be acted in that way, which is predestination. And to give an example, many of us have been awakened or come to the conclusion, thanks to the most high that has awakened our spirit, spirit of life, spirit of breath, to understand who we are biblically and historically. And that everyone is ordained to that. That's why when our mother, our father, our cousins, or people that we love close to us don't understand what we're talking about, we can't get caught up in our feelings and emotions. In essence, be glad that you get it and keep it in your heart and don't be prideful. And as always, repent and live you know, your life according to, you know, the law, statutes, and commandments to the best of your ability. So now we're at Romans chapter 11, 21 through 24, where the Most High spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of the Most High on them which fell, severity, but towards the goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. Now we know that the southern kingdom was grafted back in. So the southern kingdom was allowed to return to their land. Okay. While the northern kingdom wasn't. The southern was allowed to return because of the promises or the kingship as promised to David. Because the rulership was always going to go to Judah. Verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For the Most High is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, in reference to the northern kingdom or Ephraim, and wart grafted contrary to the nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? At Revelations chapter 11, verse 3 through 7, who are the two witnesses? And I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the most high of the earth. Now in reference to the two candlesticks, that's in reference to Judah and Israel. Because we know that's reference to the olive tree, which is in reference to the two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. And that's why uh, Christ or Hamisha calls us the light of the world which is the spiritual powers of Moses and Elijah in reference to. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have powers to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Like I said, spiritual powers of Moses and Elijah. That's what that's in reference to the spiritual powers. Now we're at Ezekiel chapter 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. Now, when I was growing up, they taught us that the Valley of Dry Bones was people waking from the dead or waking out of the graves. But as we can see in movies like Planet of the Apes or even KRS's one video, the Valley of Dry Bones is talking about the house of Judah and the house of Israel. There's also the movie Coming to America, which has in reference to the scriptures, the Valley of the Dry Bones, when Akeem and Simeon come to Brooklyn or New York, when, and they see their people in a um, low estate, as we've seen right here in the previous video with KRS one reading verse one, the hand of the most high was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and sent me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. 
and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Now we're at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 16. The man that wandereth out of the way of the understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. So the congregation of the dead is in reference to the valley of dry bones. Because most times, or a lot of times, we wander out of the way of understanding. We're in the book of Psalms, the 23rd chapter, a Psalms of David. And we also heard this in the movie, the book of Eli, which Eli was a prophet. He was a man of the Lord. And he was on the straight path. Okay, reading on, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the valley represents a low estate. A lot of our people are in a low estate. They're confused. They don't know where to turn to, or they follow different ideologies that are not based in any uh, end game or any solutions. And the mountains represent the rulership of our people in a high estate. Now we're back at Ezekiel chapter 37, starting at verse three. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knoweth. And again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the most high. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesy as I was commanded and as I prophesy, there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone. So the sinews are tendons. They connect the muscle to the bones. Also the sinews and flesh represent the coming together of the families or the coming together of the house of Judah and the house of Israel. The skin symbolizes the acquisition of education, college degrees, good professional jobs, new homes and cars. In other words, anything that contributes to a person's outer appearance or prestige, just as the skin adds to the physical appearance and beauty of the human body. But in spite of that fact that a number of black people have high paying jobs, the vast majority of black people are living in a object poverty, ignorance, confusion, and crime-infested areas, devoid of the proper leadership. Something is wrong. Something is lacking in a black man's community. Our educated people with all their PhDs have not been able to solve the problem. All the civil rights bills and Supreme Court's decisions have not solved our problems. Many of the so-called blacks are the living dead, without hope, without purpose, without guidance, and without a destiny. Prophet Ezekiel saw these living dead, the bones, the sinews, flesh and skin came together. Nevertheless, they were likened to corpse in the valley at a low estate. This valley of low estate is America. All these bodies that Ezekiel saw had no life. And the so-called black man in America has no life. He's at the bottom of the totem pole. Those ingredients necessary to sustain a viable living so-called black community are grossly lacking. And although many black people have acquired advancement into the mainstream of American society, nevertheless, in the eyesight of the most high, he has considered us a slain or dead people because the masses of so-called black people are still on the bottom of the political, economic and social level and are not guided in a proper direction. So now we're at Hebrews chapter eight, verse five through ten. Who serve until the example and shadows of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of the Most High when he was about to make the tabernacle? For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant 
which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, which is Ephraim, or the northern kingdom, and with the house of Judah, the southern kingdom, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, that being the Gentiles, or the house of Ephraim, or the northern kingdom. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now we're back at Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them, which means there was no life, or there was no ruach, which means no understanding. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an extending great army. Verse 11, Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. So now I'm going to start at verse 13. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, when I had opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. So it's talking about sovereignty. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it. For Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thy hand. in their movies as we can see planet of the apes or do the right thing um tv show on, on amazon prime i believe it's called them by uh, jordan peele and many other old movies which allude to who were the so-called blacks or who were the hebrewic or people of the scriptures which they call the israelites reading on and when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee saying, Wilt thou not show us 
what thou meanest by these. Say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. So now I'm at the book of Jubilees, chapter 15, verse 30. For Ishmael and his sons and his brothers and Esau, the Lord did not cause to approach him. And he chose them not because they are the children of Abraham, because he knew them, but he chose Israel to be his people. And he sanctified it and gathered it from amongst all the children of men. For there are many nations and many peoples, and all are his, and over all has he placed spirits and authority to lead them astray from him. Verse 32, But over Israel he did not appoint any angel or spirit, for he alone is their ruler, and he will preserve them and require them at the hand of his angels and his spirits, and at the hand of all his powers in order that he may preserve them and bless them, and that they may be his and he may be theirs from henceforth forever. Verse 33, And now I announce unto thee that the children of Israel will not keep true to this ordinance, and they will not circumcise their sons according to all this law. For in the flesh of their circumcision, they will omit this circumcision of their sons, and all of them, sons of Belnir, will leave their sons uncircumcised as they were born. And there will be great wrath from the Lord against the children of Israel, because they have forsaken his covenant and turned aside from his word and provoked and blasphemed, inasmuch as they do not observe the ordinance of the law, for they have treated their members like the Gentiles, so they may be removed and rooted out of the land. Okay, because they was worshiping Baal and other pagan or other entities or deities. And there will no more be a pardon of forgiveness unto them, so that there should be forgiveness and pardon for all the sin of this eternal error.